everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me here to um, present a bit about um, my summer in Scaries last year, which was brilliant. I had the opportunity to explore um, town parks in, in depth, and um, I'll tell you all about it in a minute. So, yeah, the project, uh, as you can see, was commissioned by Fingal, and basically the remit was to do a baseline ecology study and then to, from that, from what we found, create some actions for biodiversity in the town parks. Um, so, yeah, that's basically what, what I'll do here. I'll give a quick summary of the results of those surveys that we did and then highlight um, the key habitat areas for those species. And then um, go through a few of the okay, condensed version of the enhancements that we're proposing in the Biodiversity Action Plan, which is actually on the website for Sustainable Scaries. It's available there. I'll give you the link at the end. So yeah, I think it's, it's always a good idea to start at the bigger picture, where we are in the landscape here. It's, um, you can see town parks there in the, the dark green area within the urban fabric of Skerries. And in a way, it's ideally placed. It's a wonderful amenity area. It's massive. Uh, it's got loads of different things going on there. But also, it's, it's got this um, hinterland that is rural. And, you know, the, there's... Um, it's obvious that there's connectivity between the two. And I think the, the it, you know, it, it's good to kind of look in that, in that kind of overview kind of way so we can nurture that connectivity and understand that um, the hedgerows, the tree lines, all of that act as corridors for biodiversity, animal, commuting, et cetera. Uh, Balrallery Park up there as well. So if we, can, if we can foster that connection in the landscape, that's the kind of bigger scale of, um, um, enhancement we want to we want to see. Anyway, for our um, ecology baseline, we did some habitat mapping, um, faucet faucet style habitat mapping, um, a floral survey to kind of complement that. Um, with that, you know, noting any invasive species that we saw, uh, we carried out a few breeding bird surveys in the spring summer um, season. Uh, we did a bat survey in late June, I think it was and a mammal survey, uh, looking at kind of signs, tracks, etc. And uh, we placed a camera trap as well down by the river because we saw, we saw a lot of activity down there. So this is the results of the habitat survey. Um, you can see there seems to be a dominance of that yellow kind of hashing there, and that is GA2 immediately grassland. So to be fair, yes, that's our constraint. It's a park. So people need to use it. And the north of the park is obviously the playing fields. And yeah, they need to remain as such. So yeah, well, there's, there's going to be a compromise. But we can see that there's a lot of um, other, it's like there's a, a mosaic there. And there's a lot of differences going on there down the south as well with our, our water bodies, which are amazing. And then the, the little stream running through as well. So yeah, just to run through a few of the fossil habitats that we um, found. This is dry meadows and grassy verges. Um, so basically, that's just the seed bank that's there on its own. Without being mowed, this is what you'll get. Um, and it's, yeah, it's higher in biodiversity. Um, there's um, hop trefoil there at the top. I don't know if you could see that text. Rose bay willow herb, meadow vetchling, white clover, uh, bladder campion, to name a few. Um, there is obviously the tree lines and the woodland. They're like huge in terms of uh, provide well, in themselves, they're pretty good, but they're providing all sorts of opportunities for um, wildlife, for fauna, invertebrates, bats, birds, mammals, etc. <coughs> Equally, hedgerows and scrub, basically serving the same purpose. But we found that a lot of the hedgerows were maintained and maintained a bit severely. And um, so I think we can do a lot with that in terms of enhancing and proposing some measures for like, maybe just widening them, you know, giving them a bit more scope in the park. They're already there. Um, so yeah, these are the um, really special um, areas that like not every park has. There's ponds and 
ponds tend to act as biodiversity hotspots um, in any setting. So there's, you know, there is water quality issues with, with both of the ponds, but I think, you know, with some monitoring, with some measures, that can, that can be remediated to some extent also, and we can encourage, you know, more species to come and, and occupy those areas. So yeah, there's definitely hope, and it's brilliant that they're there. And yeah, I just think it's, you know, the jewel in the crown, the, the mills stream is just, it's amazing. Um, it has obviously been kind of altered through time. It's been, you know, messed with for the mills. Um, it's been, it's, it's original course, when you see it in historical maps, has been changed. But it's still a flowing river and it's still got some kind of vegetation, um, you know, that is historical and... Yeah, we should we should try and preserve as much as we can, and then enhance um, some ideas on that later on. But you know, we can take baby steps first, and then and see how far we can go with that. Um, and yeah, these are some of the species that have been uh, recorded. Otter, um, like a highly protected species um, under national and international um, legislation, and king kingfisher um, have even been spotted along those banks. Um, so yeah, just to, um, I won't go into detail, but yeah, that's basically how we did the vegetation survey. We, we, we took a series of spots and did quadrats at those areas. Um, and yeah, I, I think, yeah, we, we did find a few um, invasive species as well, so we noted those. So yeah, just to mention the great work that the group are already doing, you, you know this, but uh, it's the, the Carter B project in the park, and so, you know, there, there's been previous reports done and a lot of effort to enhance the area for the, the large Carter bee, which is fairly rare um, in Ireland. And so, yeah, that was in evidence because you can see the blooms that people have, you know, the group have, have planted. And, and that's going to be of benefit, not just for the large Carter bee, but for every, all the pollinators. Like, it's, um, it's, they're just brilliant flowers um, to have. All the clovers, there was a lot of vetches, um, knapweeds, um, and here's some more. Um, so dandelion, birdfoot's tref trefoil, devil's bit scabious, that's also the food plant of the fritillary, the marsh fritillary butterfly, which is um, an annexed endangered species, so maybe they'll come along too. <laughs> um, yeah, and we, we mentioned those um, invasive species, Himalayan balsam, was here last year, and I came back, it's gone. So uh, well done, everyone. I think there was some effort there made. Um, it seems to be gone, so that's brilliant. And I guess for that species, it's fairly easy to do the hand pulling. Um, it's just that it needs, to, it needs to be done over three years. So yeah, I guess there's a bit more work to do, but it looks, it looks much better. Yeah, it's, it's cleaned up. Um, Butterfly bush, yeah, so it's a medium impact invasive species. It's ubiquitous, it's everywhere, um, but it's down near the um, upstream end of the, of the river coming in from, from the farmland. And yeah, I suppose the recommendation would be to remove that before it proliferates. Um, there is some Mombrisha, but not much. Um, so again, we could probably remove that. That was up, I think, the um, northeast side of the mill the mill pond. Breeding birds, plenty. Um, so yeah, Cahill knows all about this. You're gonna, Cahill is gonna give a talk on the, on the birds tomorrow morning. Um, but yeah, briefly, we did a, um, a, I think it was three breeding bird surveys over the months of um, April, May, June, I think. And we found, we made a list of species and they're in the report, so I won't go um, into depth about it. But yeah, we found um, two red listed species, swift and kestrel. Okay, they were flying overhead, but they were there. Um, seven amber listed and 24 um, green listed species. So there's some of the amber. <coughs> nice to hear a linnet. Um, there's green finch there. And yeah, our mute swan. Um, yeah, did we know that Starling and House Sparrow are also on the amber list, which is quite shocking. And there's our green-listed guys that we know and love. Um, 
and they will exploit this, you know, there's those that enjoy the, the reeds habitat as well as, and then the passerines that are in the bushes and trees. So, and obviously our water birds. So yeah, there's, um, there's birds occupying each of the habitats that we have there. So it's brilliant. Then the bat survey. That's what we found, three species. We don't think there's a roost in the park. It would be nice if there was, but um, I think there, there might be roosting over near the chapel across the road. Um, but three species, they're probably the most common ones that um, in Ireland, uh, the common pipistrel, the soprano pipistrel, and um, the lesser, um, sorry, it's the Leisler's bat. And the, the pipistrels are very, very similar. In fact, they were thought to be the same species up to 1999. Um, but you can hear that, yeah, the, pip, the, the soprano sings a, a little bit higher. And the Leisler is kind of more of a bass tone kind of a slapping sound yeah and so then we did some mammals and um, that is the results uh, the results uh, kind of um, figure in the report there's trails that we saw um, we thought we would highlight hedgehog habitat within the park that's the brown dots there we didn't see any habitat any um, hedgehogs as such but uh, you'll see later, there are, it, within the Scaries um, grid square, there's quite a few instances of hedgehog being seen or found or chased by dogs or, you know, so I think it would be good to have some measures uh, around hedgehog, which are a, a really declining species. Um, and, yeah, not, um, I don't know, they just don't get the news, really, these hedgehogs. But, um, yeah, they should be looked after. Um, Otter was, we had seen a lot of trails down by the river. And so we, we put a cam in for six weeks and we saw a lot of traffic. Yeah, there was um, this otter or maybe a couple of otters. It seems to be different sizes, um, uh, which was wonderful to see. Um, and uh, as well as that, we saw plenty of other guys, like plenty of cats, plenty of mice, rats, um, yeah, a lot of neighborhood cats, to be fair. Um, so, yeah, hedgehogs, I've just said that, so I'm going to move on. This is a summary of the key habitats in town parks, right? So we can see that a lot of them are based down the south, um, less in the north, but, you know, we could enhance these marginal habitats to, to make them count as well, even though you have the sports pitches there. And so, yeah, that's um, a figure from the report again of the proposed actions um, and, and the locations for them. So I'll just briefly then, I have a few slides left of, it's kind of an amalgamation of the proposals that come, came out of the um, report, but it's, um, it's condensed so that, you know, nobody falls asleep. <laughs> um, so basically we've got, um, as I said, uh, the, ha the habitat enhancements, um, this is the grids where I was talking about. So people have recorded um, in their estates, um, their 100 meter squares. So it's very precise where they saw hedgehogs. And they're fairly recent as well, like this one from 2022, 20, 21. So they're there. So what better place than town parks to, you know, try and um, embrace a hedgehog? There's some areas that are, that could be kind of, um, protected from dogs, cats, etc. well, dogs mainly. Um, and even within the Scaries Mill complex, you know, that's, that's fairly kind of cordoned off anyway. So it would be a fairly safe space to set up some hedgehog log piles, leaf litter corners, and yeah, maybe hedgehog houses. Just, I think it would be a good thing to do. The, uh, the other thing is um, the, um, the mowing regime. The mowing regime is, I think there's agreements going on with the, with the council already, right? But I think that can be tailored a little bit more to, to have short sword, long sword, and, you know, enhance that a little bit further because there's, yeah, there's some nice areas down near Mill Pond, etc. But I think we could do more and do more with the verges as well in terms of leaving them alone. Um, so, yeah, as I said, pollinators and hedgerows. Um, 
yeah, the pollinators, the verges, all of that, we can do that. But we could do it within the scope of enhancing those hedgerows. So I think the idea would be to get height, you know, where we have our trees, we could, you know, enhance the, the let the hedgerows out a little bit more, create this kind of sloping structure, and then have your tall ruderals, and then maybe longer kind of, you know, um, unmown areas and then grass so that you get this kind of um, a shape and that will provide much much better kind of habitat opportunities for you know a range of different species not least you know our our invertebrates and then upwards you know throughout the um the food web um yeah i just i in in kind of looking looking at you know photos and whatnot i found this hedgerow tool toolkit for schools that was recently developed. I don't know if you've seen it, but it might be something if we're looking to engage our schools here with things to do in the park. It's got, uh, it's really well written and it's got a range of different um, activities like um, species ID of plants, then some kind of tray beating for invertebrates and invertebrate ID as well. So it just might be a good idea um, for schools to be engaged in town parks and the enhancements that um, are to come. So yeah, just a bit about the Scaries Mills complex. I think we're allowed to go in there tomorrow so we can walk around and talk about it. Um, so some ideas, I don't know, like, you know, it's, it's early days, so what will come to fruition and whatnot, but um, uh, Heritage Orchard thought that might be in keeping with, you know, the heritage tours that are ongoing in um in the mills there uh you can get varieties that go back as far as you know 1500s you know and it can just create nice good interest and you can you can eat um a herb garden same kind of scenario um you could have like a um herbs that are based on a historical kind of theme where you know we may have used them in the past and you know we don't use them so much anymore um Again, hedgerow enhancement. We've got some good hedgerows in there, but yeah, they're a little bit shorn. Um, and yeah, pollinator, there's always room for pollinator meadows somewhere, you know, in the verges or whatever, they can fit them. Another idea we had was to um, stick a bee bank because there's, we've got this theme of Carter bee going on, you know, um, solitary bees, what about them? Most of them are ground nesting and we could create a bee bank on the slope of the um, the windmill there, which is aspect is kind of south southwest, which is good. It's good for the bees, and all you have to do really is um, take a section of grass away, make it bare earth, and hope for them to come. If it's suitable, they will. So yeah, it's worth a try. Um, okay, so the Scaries Mills complex has really moved on since I was here last year. <laughs> Um, it's under construction, as I saw. Um, the idea, I don't know if it still is an idea, the outdoor classroom, but yeah, it's, it, it would be wonderful if it came to pass. And, you know, a natural structure, willow-based. Um, it could even have a roof because we're in Ireland. Um, so, yeah, there's, um, that's an, a nice idea for the, yeah, for the fact that it's a visitor centre and we can use it that way as well for an educative purpose. Um, and yeah, because the buildings are there, use the habitats, use the uh, the buildings to create, you know, species specific habitats, like swift boxes, for example, they're in the area, um, there's swallow cups. And also if there's a build ongoing, you could even integrate these bat bricks that are part of the building and they can just go in and, and, and have a, a habitat there. You can get all different kinds, that's just one example, but, um, yeah, why not make it a, a wildlife haven? Um, so yeah, lastly, just going to talk about the water bodies that we have, which is really, I think that's the knob of it. We really need to embrace what we have. And as biodiversity hotspots, yeah, we should really get to the ponds. There's a few issues with the ponds, not least water quality, but also a bit of a monoculture of reeds. There's the Phragmites reed on um, Mill Pond, which is kind of encroaching. And in fact, there seems to be a lot more reed this year than last year somehow. I don't know why. Um, but it, it's even within this, um, the reed bed just looks like it got bigger since last year. 
Um, so yeah, I think we can yeah do something with that. Um, there was also um, a suggestion to, and it's in the wider um, um, concept of redirecting the stream slightly, rewetting that reed bed would do would have a lot of benefits for wildlife, not least bird life. Um, so yeah, that was one suggestion, and I'll talk about that in a minute in the next slide. Kai pond. Um, and I think that was part of another um, wider kind of plan for skerries. There was a suggestion to regrade the margins of Kai Pond. And that would be, yeah, that would be beneficial. If you're, if you're reaching out that edge effect, you're creating more um, habitats um, as, as it graduates. Um, you could revegetate the margins a little bit more, create a bit of shade in some spaces. And again, reeds are, again, a problem. This time it's bulrush. So I suppose if you kind of swapped some over and created a little bit of diversity between the ponds, I don't know. Yeah, it's again a monoculture of bulrush though. Um, and yeah, lastly, just it's a bit bigger in scope, but river restoration for the mill stream, I think would be a really good plan. It, you can see the plan form as it is, the shape of it. It has a few different 90 degree turns in it around field boundaries, um, I suppose, historically. Uh, that's not natural. So um, because it's in an urban context, I suppose we have to be careful about how much you know, freedom the river gets. And obviously, it's amenity. And we have the new active travel route there as well. But there is some wiggle room, so to speak. And this is, I mean, that's a potential idea there, the, the lighter blue line, the, the more faint blue line of what a re-wriggled scenario might look like. But it could be slightly, have slightly more kind of um, uh, sinuosity. It could potentially be connected to some offline kind of <coughs> wetland areas, and they could be just seasonal so that birds then could take advantage. But... Um, a lot could be done. And um, this is sometimes the way that people, um, uh, restoration experts, will um, look at a channel, improving the biodiversity of a, ch of a channel that needs restoration um, in this uh, cross-sectional diagram there. So you will create a two-staged affair so that you're, you're creating more capacity um, if, if flooding is a concern, but you're also creating space for the river to uh, continue um, to flow during its low flow season and, and carve a path and have good flushing flows, but then also during the flood events to come out onto that, um, the terrace there at the side, and then and do its thing at that time of the year. So it, it does, in effect, have um, yeah some great benefits if, you know, it has some constraints. If we have some constraints, then it's potentially a good way to go. Anyway, that's not a design, that's an idea, um, but I think it's, um, it's a good one and it's such an asset to have in the park, we may as well use it and do something with it. Okay, um, I think that's me. Thank you. Uh, you're an amazing group and thanks for having me.